And this helps you perform an inspection, helps a home inspector perform a better inspection because it allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. That's what an infrared camera is. It's essentially that. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So it's very similar to my table of tools here. This guy right, is a high lumens flashlight. And um, this allows me to see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So a home inspection doesn't use the word, the standards of practice for a home inspection doesn't use the word flashlight. Doesn't use the word infrared camera or moisture meter or screwdriver. Um, but we all use one, right? It would be kind of odd to do a home inspection without a flashlight. Why? Because a flashlight allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So if there's something hidden in a dark corner, right? I'm doing a visual inspection according to a standards of practice, and I can kind of look at it. But the home inspector who carries a flashlight will actually do a better job because she will be able to see things that she normally wouldn't be able to see if she didn't have a flashlight. Same thing with infrared. Don't freak about freak, don't freak out about infrared. Right? You're trained on, on what to see what a, what a, when, when a flashlight is turned on, you know, because you've been living as a human being, what you're looking at, right? But when you use an infrared camera, it's really different. It's quite different. Right? So you have to be trained on interpreting what you are seeing with the infrared. So there's my camera, ah, sorry, there's my flashlight that I just used, and it's hot. So infrared is um, a really uh, great way to provide value to your home inspection service and um, differentiate yourself from others. And the third benefit, most important benefit, it allows a home inspector to perform a better inspection. So let's see. Let's start. It's just about time. Oh, what's the name of that camera? Um, it's a FLIR, F-L-I-R-C-2. FLIR C2. It's my favorite. I have a FLIR C2. I have a couple, actually, FLIR C2s. Um, I have a FLIR C3. I have this camera. Um, I have a FLIR, is an old one, E40BX. Um, I have, uh, I had uh, a FLIR B-CAM SD, um, that was an old one, so I like infrared cameras. I still use them. Uh, just yesterday, I was in my driveway, um, I'm, pulling, I'm driving home, pulling up in my driveway, and my neighbor is standing in my driveway waiting for me. And why? Because she knows that I'm the local neighborhood home inspector who has an infrared camera and a moisture meter, and she has a water problem. Her roof is leaking. She wants me to come over today. And I didn't have my infrared or moisture meter at home yesterday. I said, will tomorrow be great? The whole point of that is my entire neighborhood knows that I'm their local home inspector. Anything goes wrong. Just about anything. Yes, um, last week, was it last week or just a few days ago? Oh, today's Thursday. So it must have been Monday. Monday night, um, I ran over to my neighbors and helped him turn off, uh, stop a water leak. Um, he forgot to turn off the outdoor hose spigot, and um, long story short, his basement flooded because the water pipe uh, froze, expanded, cracked, thawed, and started dumping water. He wasn't home, I was, ran over, and I'm taking pictures and video and sh <laughs> um, sharing it with because I'm the local home inspector. Does everybody in your neighborhood, this is the question, right? Does everybody in your neighborhood know who you are? Does everybody in your neighborhood know to come to you because you're the local home inspector? If they don't, that's your problem. What are you doing at night? What are you doing during the day? What are you doing during the weekend? You're not marketing? I mean, you've got to start where you live. Your next door neighbor should absolutely know 
what you have in store for them. You can help them maintain their home. How? By inspecting it every once in a while. And if there's a problem, they come to you because you're the honest third party, local neighborhood home inspector. You're the expert. If they don't know that, I don't know. You're, you must be playing video games, watching TV at night. What are you doing? Are you in business or not? Because you should be marketing yourself. And that is an easy way to get about a thousand people to know you, right? There's 20, 30 neighbors within walking distance. There's probably a hundred in my neighborhood. It's probably a hundred neighbors, right? And I would say they all know me. I'm, I'm, a majority of them know me. And I don't even do home inspections anymore, right? And who are they talking to? That 50, that, those 50 neighbors are talking to 500 other people, right? Know that you have now a great marketing strategy. You have essentially ambassadors, non-unpaid salespeople talking about you, who know you, who go to you because they know you, they think you're an expert, and they value your service, and you haven't even picked up a piece of flyer or business card. That's that's a good tip. Should we start the class or are we already starting? <laughs> so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, there's a chat box somewhere on your computer, bottom right corner, usually that's where it is, and you just type in your question and I'll try to get to it. Um, so let's start, yeah? Okay, welcome to class, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico, I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, world's largest organization of home inspectors. We essentially train and certify home inspectors all over the world. And today is a webinar. And if you um, can't make it to the webinar, or if you're watching this on video and you missed the webinar, the live webinar, this is a live interactive webinar. Um, you can ask questions and I can answer them, and you can chat with other students. And we do it about once a month on NACHI TV, www.nachi, it's right there, dot TV. You go there and you register for a free online class, open to everybody, um, and we usually talk about home inspections. But we can talk about anything you want. I'm really pleased that we have 2,203 registered inspectors for this webinar. So. Um, and they're all from all over the world. We have them listed here. I just dumped, data dumped the registration and all the um, countries are there. So uh, welcome everybody from all over the world. Um, we're gonna inspect this home. Um, I inspected this home a little while ago and it was a lot of fun. But before we get there, let me show you a couple things. We already talked about NACHI TV. So www.nachi.tv is where there are free online, live, interactive classes, webinars. Um, and then all of InterNACHI's online curriculum is at this URL, nachi, N-A-C-H-I dot org slash education. And let me just go there. I'll show you kind of what it looks like. So I gotta bring this over here. And if you're ever having trouble with the webinar software, that's GoToWebinar. Um, you can refresh your screen, you can log off, find that email, click the link again, come back in, probably in just a, a few seconds. So here's our free home inspector training provided by InterNACHI. InterNACHI's online courses, they're very good courses, I'm biased, but you can take a, a look. Um, you can join InterNACHI as a member, monthly or yearly, and have access to all the courses, online courses. And let's say you want to learn about um, HVAC systems. So you type in the field HVAC, and on the right side, we have the HVAC training courses. So there's a few training courses about HVAC systems. If you wanted to learn about roofs, you type in roof, and there's several really good roof inspection courses. Okay, and that's on our education page at natchiorg slash education. Performing an inspection is fairly straightforward. All the knowledge that you need, all the knowledge, skills, abilities that you need to perform an inspection can be gained through InterNACHI's online curriculum. 
What's difficult is building and operating a successful home inspection business because that knowledge is beyond the scope of a home inspection. The scope of a home inspection, according to the standards of practice, is how you perform an inspection. So you can be technically competent in performing an inspection, but have a terrible business, right? You want to do well in both. You want to go online and learn how to perform an inspection, fairly straightforward, identify things, inspect them, is it bad or good? Put it in the report. Huh? But you also want to be good at business and marketing. Otherwise, you're a great home inspector, but nobody knows who you are. Or the opposite is could be, you're really great at marketing, right? but you haven't done any courses or you're a terrible home inspector. That's bad too. Right? We want you to be good at both. We want you to be good technically and with business and marketing. And so online, if you go to that education page and type in business, you'll get an online home inspection business course. I recommend you take that. If you haven't formally taken any kind of marketing, business, training, education course, take that one. It's a free online course open to everybody. So where do you start and what do you do next? Well, go to natchi.org slash everything. It's right there. We try to put everything that's important there. International's website is huge. It could be overwhelming. You can't find anything. It could be frustrating. I apologize for that. So what we do is we have pages, specific pages, for you to maybe, um, if you are trying to begin, what is step one, step two, step three, right? So on slash everything, we have 15 chunks of information in a sequential order, step by step. S step one is join InterNACHI. Why? Why do you want to join InterNACHI? Well, once you join InterNACHI, it's like um, a door has opened up, right? With a world of opportunity. And so to be a member of InterNACHI, you get access to an enormous amount of information that can help you be the best inspector and a great business owner. Let's say you need some more personal interaction. Well, we have a mentoring program. So, oh, let's go to, let's go to the everything page, okay? Slash everything, oh, I have to drag it over again. And this is what it looks like. Just wanted to show you what it looks like so you know you're on the same page. So 15 steps for a successful home inspector, little video, step one, Step two, you get trained and certified. Step three, you have a members only account. It's an online portal. Every member has that. Here's that free business, home inspection business course you should take. And then you start with your brand and your marketing. We can talk about that. And then you need a website for sure. On and on and on, 15 steps, okay? Um, the other one is natchi.org slash mentoring. I can spell it. And here, InterNACHI provides peer-to-peer -peer interactive learning experience learning experiences with another experienced inspector and it doesn't matter where they are where they are um, they could be in your maybe climate zone that would be a good idea some geographical area so you can share the same experiences with the same kind of houses that you inspect unless you just want to talk about business so we have a mentoring program and you can find a mentor you click that button there to find a mentor and these um, mentors have agreed to volunteer their time. They're experienced home inspectors, and they're so experienced and confident that they want to just share what um, has made them successful. It's kind of like what I'm trying to do in this webinar. Um, I used to be a home inspector uh, 12 years in Pennsylvania, southeast area in Philly, highly competitive market, a lot of inspectors um, fighting for the same pieces of pie. Uh, before that, I was a home builder. Built a few homes and a barn, and I just want to share what I know about home inspections and running a business, and hopefully that helps you. Um, if you wanted a coach, um, I know this coach. She's very good. If you want to grow your business and make more money, um, she has a coaching service. She also has uh, a website review service, so she'll take a look at your website. And um, there's tools. What I really like is the downloads. I like free stuff, free downloads. So. You go to our downloads page and you download the free eight steps checklist. Um, she's chunked 
um, a program into eight steps, if you follow the eight steps, um, you have achieved a lot. It takes a while um, to do all the things that is necessary to run a successful home inspection business. In fact, you should start thinking about yourself not as a home inspector, but a business owner who just happens to perform home inspections, right? So we want you around for a while, a long time. We want you to be part of the internet family. For as long as you are in business, um, we have, we, we want you in the family, essentially. And what do we do? We provide everything you need to be successful. Like the sign says, right? Everything you need all in one place, right? And if there's other things that you need, like coaching, um, we have resources for that as well. Mentoring, we have resources for that as well. Okay? Um, the main thing that you receive when you become an Internet G certified home inspector is recognition, certification. This is a federally registered certification mark. See that little R? No one on the planet can say I'm a certified professional inspector CPI unless they've gone through the Internet G training and certification program. Right? So put that on your marketing. Don't do this. I'm from Internet G, so I'm promoting Internet G, right? Don't put Internet G on your, on your business cards or whatever. Put that. That is what people are looking for. People don't know Internet G. They don't know the differences between the organizations. They're looking for the typical home buyer, say, is looking for an inspector. Hopefully they're professional and they're certified. That's exactly why we got this registration mark. Certified Professional Inspector. When you become Internet G Certified Professional Inspector, you get that logo. All right, let's learn how to perform a home inspection. Let's do, let's review an inspection that I did. And we can talk about the technical aspects of how to do a home inspection. We can also talk about anything else you want, but I wrote uh, various topics. Software, writing reports, business, scheduling and time management, hiring inspectors, growing your business, branding, marketing, you need a website, and what should you charge? Calculating a profitable fee, not just charging. How do you calculate what's a profitable home inspection fee? Handling complaints, standards of ethics. How do you market to real estate agents? That was one of the downloads from inspectorcoach.com. All right, let's take a look at this house. Let me look. Um, oh, it's like here. Here are your tips for inspecting permanent wood foundations. It's, um, it's an uncommon type of foundation. So I've inspected only a handful of them. Um, they were built typically by Amish, I don't know why, um, in Pennsylvania. And so I have some personal experience about it, but we have really good tactical training on that type of foundation in our, um, in our online course titled um, um, how, to, how to perform inspections on structures, um, foundations, and piers. So just type in foundation in the, on the education page, and you'll get to the course. And then it's on the left side. Every course has a left side navigation menu, and you just jump down to permanent wood foundations. Randy, good question. Um, Jim really likes the new dashboard that we put together. Every member of InterNACH has their online dashboard and portal. Um, and can we talk about double taps? Sure. Um, I, whenever I see a double tap on anything, whether it's a neutral lug or a ground lug nut or a, a breaker itself, I kind of flag it. It could be designed for a double tap. It could be, but I'm going to bring it up, especially if there's a overfusing. And I know that um, no one did a permit to finish the basement, and they're just they just did a circuit, grabbed the light fixture and wall receptacles. 50, 14 gauge wire and a 20 amp breaker, um, and they just tapped it in there. Uh, so I'm going to call it out. Um, so double taps, those are easy to see, and I usually call them out. Um, you're in South Florida, and I see this a lot. Okay. All right, let's go. So people in all over the country, um, I try to um, mix up the types of houses that we inspect. So this one's going to be kind of unusual for many of you, but let's just give it a go. Um, you're going to see oil, by the way, 
I think this house is over an oil fire tank. I made a thousand dollars a day. Gross. I made a thousand dollars a day for years and years of my life. It was really good. Even in a downturn. That's pretty good. I mean, personally for me, maybe that's not enough for you. Personally for me, that was really good. Bought a house, had two cars, three kids, five chickens. <laughs> and uh, that's a really successful criteria for me. That threshold was really good. How did I make $1,000 a day? I did two home inspections a day. Now remember, this is gross. And again, you have to take a business course to understand there's a difference between gross and profit margin. Right, gross is gross is almost uh, who cares? If someone tells me my company did a million dollars in gross revenue last year, you know, well, that's you know, it sounds really impressive. Congratulations, but did you make any money? Right, it's all about calculating profitable fees. What was your profit margin? Right. So, what did you actually make? What did you actually put in your pocket? I remember almost the first home inspection I ever did. Stopped doing what I was doing and did an inspection on a Saturday morning and um, came home four hours later with $300 of cash in my pocket. And my wife was like, let's go get groceries, right? And let's do this over and over again every Saturday, right? So that's why you're in business. <laughs> if, if you're not in business to make a lot of money, I don't know why you're in business. Because if you want to make a good living, you get a good job. If you want to make a lot of money, have cash in your pockets, have whatever you need in your life, and then to do good in your life, if, if you wanted to do good and do great things outside of your media family or something like that, yeah, you have the resources to do that. But initially, to be in business, it's all about making money. Right? And then you can do good in the world. So for me, it was $1,000 a day. In fact, for every inspector who worked in my company, it was $1,000 a day. I wanted them to bring home gross 1000 bucks. And out of that, I knew exactly what my costs were. And I, my profit margin was big. Right? Here's my schedule. This is my actual schedule on how I did a typical day and brought home over $1,000. I start early. But I come home around 4.30, and for being in business on your own, that's a pretty good day, right? So you leave early, about 7. That means you got to wake up 6.30. Um, arrive at job 1 early. Job 1's at 8 o'clock. I arrive early. If I arrive on time, I'm late. So you arrive early, you get prepared, and then job 2 is at 12 o'clock, noon. And in between there, Give myself an hour for driving and eating at the same time. I don't stop and sit and eat. I get to my next job early, right? Um, if I arrive early, which I usually do, I inspect the roof. Why? You don't have to. Really don't. It's really up to you. What do you want to do? What do you want to inspect first? S some inspectors have told me they like to inspect the kitchen first. Well, for me, that doesn't work because I want to arrive early. I want to do something. I want to start working. So one of the systems that I can start inspecting is it's either the exterior or the roof. And since the roof is the most difficult one, and it doesn't require my client to be with me, especially if there's a ladder, um, I'm going to do it first. So I inspect the roof. And I'm up on the roof, and I'm inspecting. I'm taking pictures. I'm writing my report because I write while I inspect. Everybody should. Who is writing inspection reports at night? No one should be. Unless you're not very serious in being in business. I mean, you have to be serious about your time. This is time management. There's software out there that allows you to be time efficient. You're not running through the house and blowing things off. You're actually being efficient with your time, which means you do multiple things at the same time. You have to talk, walk. Chew gum, write the report, inspect, communicate, all that stuff, all at the same time, right? Um, so I arrive at job one early, get up on the roof. You don't have to get up on the roof. I do. Um, that's part of my brand, and we can talk about that. It's way beyond the standards of practice. It's very dangerous. 
a fall is fatal. Uh, a fall from one foot, one step on a ladder can break your ankle. It's so don't do it. But I'm, I want to share that I did it, and it was part of my brand. And I did that so also when my client arrives after I'm done with the inspection of the roof, I'm just about to get on the ladder. When my client pulls up at eight o'clock because I'm early into the driveway, I wave to them from the roof. And I always thought that. If I was in their shoes, they'd be looking up through the windshield and thinking, oh, that crazy inspector, I hired the right inspector. And they'd say, well, we hired the right inspector. Because look, he's up there on the roof. I didn't expect that. You know, I wanted to impress my clients. I wanted to overwhelm my clients with incredible value. Some of the things I knew were valuable to my clients, I, I obviously provided to them. So I'm a good business person. Some of the things I had to guess, and one of them was, I think my clients appreciated, valued, that I actually went up on the roof, at least to the gutter edge, or the gable, or the, you know, the, somewhere. Somehow I inspect the roof closely, and, and I had a ladder. I personally wouldn't, wouldn't hire a home inspector if they didn't have a ladder, and I was buying a, a townhouse, a two-story townhouse. I mean, how we have to get up there, right? I want the right inspector, right? I want to pay for that right inspector. It's valuable information. If that information that I need, I need to know the condition of the roof from the consumer, the home buyer, and I want to know the information about my roof, I'm willing to pay someone who's going to provide me that information because it's valuable to me when I'm buying my dream home to know the condition of the roof. So if you are in business and you know what your client needs and values and they're willing to pay for that information, you should provide it. The whole goal, the general rule of thumb in business is if the perceived value is greater than the cost, then it's a good decision. And that works for consumers as well as business owners. For a consumer, if the perceived value of hiring this particular type of inspector, if the value is overwhelming in comparison to the cost, then I'm going to hire that inspector instead of the other one, who doesn't seem to provide any value or benefits. It also works in business too. If the value is greater than the cost, then it's a good business decision. Like example, um, here, the, the home inspection, the the home maintenance book. Now that you've had a home inspection, this is an older edition. This is a 12th edition. If the perceived value of me providing this to my clients is greater than the cost. The cost is $2.70, whether it's the um, typical cover or a, um, a cover that's customized to my business. It's a customized cover, and the Internet Cheese marketing team does this. This is a fantastic thing that they do. You can get the regular cover or a customized cover. It's the same cost. If the value perceived value from my client is greater than the cost. I think the perceived value is like, it's 20 bucks, 1995. You can probably get this on Amazon, something similar like this, full color inside. It provides information that I don't need to provide during the inspection and waste everyone's time about home maintenance. That's valuable. Information has weight to it. It's valuable. So heck of a lot value, heck of a lot it's only two dollars and seventy cents. Cost me nothing. If actually I raise my inspection fee five dollars and provide a two dollars and seventy cent product or service, I just raise my inspection fee and my clients pay for their own home maintenance book and a cup of coffee for me every day. I don't buy anything. I don't. I don't. Even my infrared camera, right? My infrared camera that we that we had on. My FLIR C2 for $500, go to Inspector Outlet, right? Members get discounts or special pricing consideration. I would just raise my inspection fee a few dollars, and over the year, this would be purchased. By who? Not by me. I don't want that overhead. My clients. My clients buy the tools that I use 
that I, in return, provide great value. Does that make sense? Like, I'm not going to think, oh, $600, oh, $2.70 for a customized link Nope, this is just an opportunity to provide value, and that overhead is going to be paid for by my client. Oh, we're like three slides in, and we haven't even gotten anywhere. Well, anyways, here's my minute-by-minute -minute breakdown of how I inspect a house. At 8.15, 9.15, that big chunk there, that's where it gets juicy because that's where all the difficult stuff is. HVAC, plumbing, electrical, then we move the foundation. And after that, around 10 o'clock, I've been there for two hours, I'm kind of like done. Because the attic is unfinished spaces, that's easy. And moving through the interior, grabbing the bathroom, grabbing the garage, the kitchen, I end up in the kitchen where it's nice and warm. You know, the kitchen's a good place to end. It's where everyone gathers. It's where the coffee is. <laughs> and uh, um, that's where I end and summarize my findings. I print out my inspection report because I'm using software on my mobile device. And uh, I can print it if I wanted to or just punch it into the cloud. And it's a summary. And that's what my client and their agent needs, just a summary. But I was inspecting as well. I was taking pictures and inspecting. So I can actually cloud it to the, I mean, push it to the cloud. And it's available immediately by email. Right? So that's what I do. I make 500 some dollars on the first job, second job, another 500 some dollars. How do I go from a $350 home inspection to making over $500 per inspection? Ancillary services, providing the additional ancillary inspection service at the right time, the right inspection at the right time. I'm already doing a home inspection. I would feel terrible if I was just doing a home inspection, right? I should have been able to attach or bundle. One way to distinguish yourself from others is to bundle services. Everyone loves bundling. Bundle some services or products, and reduce the price of the whole a little bit, right? If you individually add them up, it's seven hundred dollars. But if you bundle it, it's six fifty or six hundred, right? I'll do that. In my business, when we did a home inspection, seventy-five percent of all home inspections were bundled with a radon test, and fifty percent were bundled with a wood destroying organism inspection, and ten were bundled with a water quality, and then it went down from there. So it's potentially like. There's profit in that. If it, and there's another general rule of thumb. If it doesn't add more time, significant, substantial amount of time, if it doesn't add more time, then you can do that ancillary service. And it will be literally just profit. Yep. So here is where you go to get ancillary inspection certification. So natchi.org slash certification. Internachi provides more than 45 additional inspector certifications. Not just home inspection, not that CPI. Remember, we talked about the CPI logo. But we have all these other. There's a drone certification. There's um, a commercial inspector. There's a deck inspector. There's a garage inspector certification. There's an indoor air quality inspector certification. There's a meth house hazard inspector certification. A lot of other additional certification. You put this. It's almost like you copy paste. You put this. You can try it. Try to copy it, paste it on one of your web pages that says something like my qualifications or why hire me. Because the inspector with the most badges wins in that kind of value area. The value of you being certified in everything is incredible. I'd pay for that. The more value you bring to your business, the higher fees you can demand. Okay? Um, so your homework is write down what your day looks like. When do you want to start? When do you want to end? If you're only doing one inspection, you got to calculate that. How many inspections are you planning on doing during the week, the month, the year? Add it up. What's your annual desired annual salary? What's your overhead? What's your profit margin? Divide that by your time or the number of inspections that you do. It's all about math, right? 
7.45 to 8 o'clock, I'm inspecting the roof. And bam, that picture is in my inspection report. Why? Well, I walk on the roof. I'm telling you, don't. It's fatal if you fall. It's not required. According to the standards of practice, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. The standards of practice link is right there. You can click it, natchez.org, SOP. It says you're not required to walk upon any roof surface, not even a, a one-story flat roof. You're not required to walk upon it, right? But I do. Why? Well, I felt that it was better for me to do it as an inspector. I got to see more. I got to see defects that I wouldn't normally be able to see if I was inspecting it from the ground. So there's an advantage there. I found, I did a better inspection than my competition. And the other reason was this amazing show, photo was on my website, in my marketing, and in my best marketing piece that I could create, which is my inspection report. You can put that also on social media, right? And blast this out. That says a lot. You actually walk upon roofs and it looks really tall and it was. That's okay. I wanted to be, if I'm going to do something in my inspection, in my normal routine process of performing an inspection, and it's better than my competition, I have a duty to tell everybody about it. Right? The result is I'm going to beat my competition because I am communicating value. It's on my social network, my channels, my neighbors know it. Everybody knows I carry 40-foot aluminum, 32-foot fiberglass, 28-foot fiberglass, 12-foot aluminum, and crossface gear. I go from all the way down in the ground like a worm and all the way up on the roof like a bird. Everything in between. Inspect everything. Touch everything, walk on everything. And that's going to be in my inspection report because my inspection report is going to be passed around to my clients, their friends, their coworkers, their relatives, their neighbors. And I want them to know why I'm the best inspector. By the time they're finished reading my inspection report, which is like my marketing book, at the end of the read, they should be fully convinced that I'm the best inspector in the world. That's how you should think. It's really fun, right? And then you're in friendly competition with a lot of other inspectors around you. Because everything you do is part of your business. It's part of marketing. So I throw in these pictures as well, just in case you need to know that I was inspecting everything. Well, I was. I take pictures of every field, every plane, every system, every component of every system from afar and up close, like that. I touch the shingles. I know the condition of the shingles. Why? Because I was on it and I was touching it. And that's a ridge vent. Those shingles are in good shape, dimensional shingles. And I report upon the condition of the roof covering materials. I'm not reporting upon the roof system. The roof system includes underlayment, includes fastening. That's way beyond your visual inspection, right? So why are you commenting on it? Roof covering material, or the roof surface, or the apparent condition of the roof covering material surface. <laughs> You're not inspecting the system. Careful about that. Love that shot. So I was pulling it up, seems to be adhered. Looks in really good shape. This asphalt shingle roof is in really good shape. Ooh, chimney, old house, chimney. Um, it's an old house, right? I know it is. Everyone knows it's an old house. It's 80 years old. It's an old house. But I'm inspecting it without regard to the age of the home. When it comes to reporting upon indications of defects that I see. And I think there's going to be a defect in this chimney because it's an old house and it better have a flu. I'm not going to, if it doesn't have a flu, I'm not going to say anything like, well, it's historical. Well, it's grandfathered. Well, it was built 100 years ago. Nope, it's a fire hazard. So you should consider inspecting your homes without regard to the age of the home. It could be a brand new home. It could be 100 years old. 
For example, if there's a missing flue, that's a hazard. The bricks are in okay shape. The flashing is actually very good. The counter flashing is a little uh, off. It should be tighter with the step flashing, but that's okay. There's the flu. It's a missing flu. That's a fire hazard. It's a hazard, especially if it's being used. I'm, I know it's being used because um, it, you can just tell there's warmth coming out of it. Um, it's a cooler day, and it's just being used. You can tell. Now, there's no flu. This is a low-res image. I mean, this the pixel size is 640 by 480. But, so you don't have to take megabyte pictures. You don't have to um, take very high resolution 4K photos and video. Right? That's clear, clearly understood that there's a missing flu in this chimney stack. So they need a flu liner, and that's the neighbor's flu. And there's one brick width in between. Who knows what's going on with the gases in there? Really cool shots. That's just my camera with uh, a zoom. And that's me getting up on the roof. And as I come down, I look at the gutters, see if there's any venting, ventilation, any fascia, eaves issues. And I'm down on the, this is the back side. I believe it's the back side of the roof. Yeah. And there's a, a secondary roof. So I'm on this porch roof, roof on the back. Well, it used to be a porch, and then he enclosed it. Some debris in the gutters. Wherever there's two different materials touching each other, intersecting each other, I want to see flashing. And if there's an open gap, I want to see that open gap flashed or sealed. So there's flashing there. That's good. Flashing and sealant around the windows. They've been capped, old windows. The vinyl siding is probably installed on top of brick or something. There's a shot of the backyard. And not required to, but I'll take a look at the, the driveway in the back there in the parking area for sure. But um, that little ancillary shed, I'll take a look at that. And I'm thinking also of how water is collected by the roof, controlled, captured by the gutters, controlled by the downspouts, and discharged away. You are not required to inspect or be responsible for anything that goes underground. So I don't know exactly what happens when it's raining. It's not raining today. It could just overflow. It's hard surface. It doesn't look like dirt is eroding. There's no indications that there are any problems with the underground drainage pipe, but there might be. I'm not responsible for it. I also do videos as well. So let's see if, before we get to the defect definitions, Um, ben, what was the inspection pricing on this property? I actually don't know. There's um, two ways to handle pricing. One is you tell everybody what your price is with some options um, for you know, exceptions to the rules like where you have to add money um, because of the age of the home or the size or the distance. Um, that's how I did it. I had a base price, $396, $396. But you know, I started off in the business, you know, 190, and we went to 220, and on and on. Um, and we raised our fees because we were providing value. Um, if the again, if the value that you provide is kind of incongruent with the cost, with the your fee that you're charging, um, you've got a problem with your with your business, and no one's going to hire you you have to show overwhelming value in order to demand higher fees. So that house there, if I was doing inspections, 400 minimum, but I probably did other things on top of it. Um, and the ancillary inspections are sometimes a decision based upon um, where you are. I'm in Colorado right now. One out of two homes in Colorado have elevated levels of radon. So every home inspector does radon as well. Um, how do you inspect roofs in bad weather? I don't. I mean, you know, I, I try to be safe. I've got a family, right? So I want to come home. That's the most important thing, always being safe. Um, if it's slightly wet, for some reason, asphalt shingles to me was just a little bit stickier. I don't know why. If it was snow and icy, um, and, uh, you know, that it was low to the ground and safe, I sometimes went up there with a broom. Right? 
all I wanted to do was get some kind of eyes on some part of the roof. So um, I hardly ever um, excluded a roof from my inspection. I was always able to get out there somehow. Nowadays, uh, like two years ago, I wasn't all that crazy about drones, but nowadays I've got a drone myself. And we fly drones, we have a drone course. Um, it's um, fairly available to a home inspector to be a drone pilot through the FAA. You gotta take the pilot exam. We have a course that helps you take that uh, exam. Um, and you can do uh, a drone video or drone image imagery with 4K resolution so you can blow it up. So if you have a drone and I don't, but I have ladders, um, that'd be a really cool way to compete with each other. How am I gonna compete with Bob who has a drone and I use ladders, right? So Bob's website probably has a home page, a hero image that has some kind of aerial view and he's standing there with his controllers and he's waving. That'd be an awesome shot. Um, I'm probably going to put me on a ladder somewhere um, and getting up on the roof, something like that. And we'll compete. And it'll depend upon what people value. right? So um, you have to think about that kind of stuff too. You don't have to get up on every roof, especially in bad weather. What are the most important tools and meters and software should an inspector, a new inspector get? That's easy. Um, you need a flashlight, high lumens flashlight, right? Um, you, need, <laughs> you need these things. Um, flathead and a Phillips. I like, and I don't have it with me, I don't know where. It's a combination, it's like a six and one, so you hold one and you pull out uh, the flathead and, s and spin it and it becomes Phillips, or you pull it out like this and you can take um, uh, a, a screw out, uh, like a hex screw or something, so there's like six and one sets in it. Um, I would uh, get a moisture mirror, even if you don't have a, um, an infrared, but that's next. Um, moisture meter with pins, and um, a non-invasive surface. This is a protometer. This is an X-Tech, kind of like that. Um, the microwave detector, it's kind of like the shock and awe. You stick that in the microwave with a cup of water, and it turns red if there's microwaves. Um, I use this when I wanted to, um, it's a laser thermometer, so I ping the, um, the registers, um, electric baseboards, um, um, boiler baseboards, the, water baseboards, radiators, um, and then um, these are my favorite too. Um, this is an extendable hoe. Oh, so the whole total price is just a few hundred bucks. And a flashlight, a good one is, you know, 200, $200 dollars for a flashlight, but it's, you know, LED lumens. And then the other tools, well, you need a razor, that's nothing, the mirror. Infrared is probably the most expensive so far. For 450, 500 bucks. This is an extendable hoe. It's probably 50 bucks. So it extends. It has three tines on it, uh, like fingers. Um, I heat one up and I straighten it so that um, I can poke. And the other are um, for um, hooking and grabbing insulation and then putting it back. And no one knows. Um, this is a hydro shark. Very difficult to find, um, but it, they're still around. So you got to Google it but it's a moisture meter. So there's pins here, and it gives me a, a little symbol and an audio. And what I do is I can reach, right, a ceiling, and I can also go around uh, a basement and go through the carpeting and padding, right? So that's an easy thing. Uh, if you're doing well flows or water flows, you need a water meter. Um, those are the tools. One of the most important tools is if you do a lot of vacant homes in the morning, you need one of these. I wore this instead of putting Peach Inspections. That was my company name, Peach. Peach Inspections on the back. I wore this so that everybody knew I'm not trying to rob the place or break in. I'm the inspector. Um, yeah, so those are the tools. It's a very low entry point. Um, you don't need to invest a lot of money to get in. 
One of the other expensive things would be um, software. It's essential. You need software. Um, I have software on my phone. Um, let's see. Come on. There it is. Oh, hold on. Where? So software got it. is essential. Sorry, that's my wife. And that's Inspector Coach. I have Home Inspector Pro. Home Gauge works on PCs, I believe. Um, and I have Spectora on my um, phone. And I also have like Pitch Factor, which is an app. So, whoop. so Pitch Factor does this, allows me to measure the slope of the roof. I don't know why they say pitch. Home inspectors use slope, not pitch. Pitch is that black stuff, tar. Um, this is a cool app about m how to measure things. So let's see if I can actually get it to work. So if I measure, if I want to measure something, like I try and get it and I measure over here, and then I measure over here, and then I measure over here, this way, I measure this way, that, right? And then I measure like that. You see this? Hope you can. Oh, oops. Oops, I'm shaking too much. But anyways, it can measure for you. And then, um, if you want to measure that, so that's 15 inches. Oh, shoot. Let's try it again. There. It's clear. So I'm to measure this. Mm -hmm. This distance. There. Maybe I'm not doing it right, right. Sorry about that. It's a new app that I'm learning. It actually measures, takes measurements in 3D space, and then you can snap the picture of it if it was working. Hmm. I don't know. It was working for me just a little while ago. Technology again, right? How about um, the compass? Obviously. So where's north? North is that way. East is towards you. And then there's software. So I'm learning um, Spectora has good software. Um, in the residential report, uh, basically here's the roof, roof covering materials. Oops. Um, I inspected it from the ladder. And let's take a picture of the roof. Let's say this is a picture of the roof. Very nice. Here's that photo. And then uh, it's asphalt shingles. Uh, it's five to ten years. Um, there's cracked roof covering material. Oh no. There's cracked. No, 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 no. That's right. Cracked roof covering material. I take a picture of that. And that goes in the report. Right? And I can take arrows and stuff if I wanted to. Just fun. And that goes in the report. And so while I'm inspecting, I'm taking pictures. You can also do video, so you can do video. Hey everybody, there's my webinar room, tabletop. You can put that video in the report and throw it to the cloud, and now your inspection reports are immediately available with 100 photos and video, and you're inspecting and writing at the same time. That's really efficient with your time. And in your report, I would identify defects I would recommend using some type of um, um, definition standard that identifies the uh, degree of the issue. So if it's a minor problem, you should say minor. If it's a major problem, you should say major. Or if it's a material defect, which is defined as a defect that you saw and put in the report, deemed it to be material, that's something that's going to pose an unreasonable risk to someone's life, that's a material defect. So these definitions of different types of defects are in our glossary at natchee.org slash glossary. A cosmetic defect is like a superficial flaw uh, to stain on the carpet. Minor defect can be repaired by the homeowner. Major defect, you need a contractor and 
material defect, it's going to hurt someone. And I would use those definitions in my report so that when I take a picture of a defect, I tag it as cosmetic, minor, major, material. And it's already defined. Eight o'clock, I'm done with the roof inspection and I'm walking down and I'm looking at how rainwater is collected and controlled and diverted away from the house. I'm also done with writing the roof system. So the inspection report is partially, completely done. I'm done inspecting it, I'm done writing it. You should write your report as you inspect. Why? Because to make money, you have to think about math. The top part is the numerator of the, of the fraction. There's a fraction, right? Two numbers divided by. Top number is numerator. That's the amount of money that you're charging. Divided by what? Your time. If your time is taking all day, if you're taking all day making money, uh, you're going to go out of business. You need to reduce that time. You need to reduce that denominator. And you only can do that make money like $500 in five hours is $100 an hour, right? But if you only spend three hours, then you're going to make more money per hour. And that's where you want to be. You want to be efficient with your time. One great way of being efficient with your time in your home inspection business is to write your report as you inspect so that you're not spending time at night after dinner writing your reports, which is open to error because you can't remember what you saw eight hours ago. But you, this helps reduce mistakes. When you go mobile, you can have your checklist of what you're supposed to be inspecting right here on your phone. Yeah. So it helps reduce errors, keeps you in line with your process, um, helps you perform an inspection according to a standards of practice, and most importantly, it helps you manage your time so that your numerator is really big and your denominator of your time is really small. Money divided by time. 8 to 8.15, I'm inspecting ex the exterior. It's no big deal. It's not an hour to inspect the exterior. You just walk around with your client, show them the materials, the covering, the GFCIs, the steps, things like that, and you push them in because that's where they want to go. They want to measure things and start thinking about renovating and doing the bathroom and the kitchen. Um, but maybe you have recommendations that they ought to, at the end of the inspection, you probably have recommendations that they ought to be aware of. So there's the exterior. It's actually a, a fake stone application on top of brick. So whenever there's masonry, I take a look for cracks. Um, and whenever there's two materials coming together, I look for flashing or sealant. How do those two um, interact with each other and touch each other? And I take a lot of pictures. I'm touching a lot of things. And there's a crack, hairline, Settlement, brick underneath it, I'm not really concerned about it. The exterior looks good. Take pictures of all the minor cracks. Some of the cracks have been repaired. Whenever I see that the homeowner repaired something, I put it in the report and I ask my client to ask the seller to explain what has been repaired and why. It kind of relieves me of that burden. Cracks here and there, not bad. Nothing's loose. Two different materials coming in contact with, it, with, it, with each other. There's the electrical line coming down to the meter, the side of the house. The downspout, I want it diverting water away from the house, not at the corner of the house, which I think this used to be a porch in the back, and they enclosed it. So we'll take a look at that in that corner, see if there's carpentry ants or wood rods or moisture problems, and all along there, especially when I see algae growing on the siding. So I think about water as I'm inspecting the exterior, think about how water hits the roof, is controlled, collected, and diverted away from the foundation. It should slope, first 10 feet around the foundation should slope about six inches down. To help with explaining these things, that's a really nice illustration that was designed and, and created by 
the Internet Team Member Marketing Team. And you can get those illustrations at natchee.org slash gallery. And take screenshots or download them and upload them into your software and put them in your report. No cost to members. Sidewalk is a little cracked. I'm not too concerned. A little low, close to the ground. Not very concerned. That concerns me. Siding in contact with the ground. I want to take a look on the inside, see what's going on. Ideally, there should be some clearance there. Driveway, parking area, old, kind of beat up, asphalt, concrete. All right, no big deal. Shed, a lot of wood rot on the bottom of the shed roof. Shed roof shingles are okay for a shed. Not bad. Nothing major going on. It was locked. Inspection restrictions, so I can't get in. The concrete walkways, they're kind of cracked up. It's okay. No major trip hazards. That's why I don't want. Electrical line, overhead electrical line, drip loops securely attached to the house. Electric meters are securely attached to the house. The line going into the house, the service conductor is going in to the electrical panel. I'm going to inspect that and follow that in. It looks like the sewer line or um, something was chopped into the, the sidewalk. If the homeowner is responsible for that, I want them to know the condition so that it's kind of, you know, it's in poor condition. So if there's a trip hazard, um, it's not very smooth, then I want my client to know about that. They may need to be responsible. And here's, here's where we talk about code. So before we get to code and stairs and handrails, um, let's see. Oh, there's a ton of questions. I don't know if I can get to them. I would like advice on advertising because I'm not getting any calls. So, Angela, um, I get that question a lot. So, um, there's a few things that you need to focus on, and I would go to inspectorcoach.com and download the eight steps. That'll help you. Make sure you have a web presence, right? Because why? I don't even go to a restaurant unless I visit the website and look at the food. I would assume people uh, don't go to a movie, buy a $15 ticket to a movie before they watch the previews. Right? If they like the previews, they go to the movie. Same kind of mentality, right? We like to see, like the test drive before we purchase, right? Test drive a car before you buy it. Same thing with the home inspection company. You have to have a presence. Allow people to see what they are about to hire because your client won't meet you until after they hire you. It's kind of a weird thing. So let them meet you online. you got to have a really nice, modern-looking website. Get it critiqued by someone. There's certain things, there's like a dozen things that all beautiful, modern, effective websites have. And um, so you need that. That's one thing. And then you should be on social media like crazy, just, from, just talking it up, providing value. Talking to your past clients, telling them for refer, asking them to refer you to their friends, right? Have your have your friends, have your clients' friends talk to you, right? Connect. There's a lot of things that doesn't doesn't take any money. The, the website, you can do a free website off of a template service, have a beautiful website within a couple minutes for your home inspection business. Social media, talking it up. Providing valuable information like this is a defect, take a picture of a defect, this is a defect that I found. Inspect your own home if you don't have a home inspection. Defect that I found, explain what uh, a dirty air filter does. Snap the picture or do a little video, a selfie, put it on Facebook, tweet it, whatever you want to do. Get it out there. You should have a YouTube channel right, for your business. Um, these are all, nothing is secret. There are no secrets to success. All right, there's, there's a lot to do, but nothing is like unknown. So think of it as, um, think of it as um, like pushing the little levers forwards to be successful. You have to do a lot of things, a lot of things, all kind of like at the same time, and just a little bit of progress on each one. You don't just crank up all of your training. It's like a soundboard. Ever see those soundboards when there's a band? That's what I'm thinking of. You see those soundboards, you know, all the microphones from the band, 
are plugged into the soundboard and the person in control is listening and tweaking the soundboards and there's all those lev uh, levels and th that's what I'm talking about. So imagine your business as like a soundboard, a big box with levers and you're pushing them all up. You don't want to just grab one and push it up like online training. I'm going to do all the online training without working on anything else. No, you have to work on a lot of things. Website, business card, logo design or redesign, um, inspection vehicle, and tools, insurance, taxes, marketing, convention, you know, it, just all these things. Post on social media, post on YouTube, post on Facebook, answer comments, reply back, do an email, no, no, you know, just keep going forwards with all these little pieces of tracks. Yeah, I hope that's a terrible analogy, but that's what I mean. There's a lot of things to do. So there's a, several resources you can go to. Again, we talked about this before earlier. Internet Cheese Online Business Course is a really great resource. Right? Learn at your own pace. You can review and review over and over again on what you need, the basic foundation stuff to build a successful business. And then there's advanced things. There's a lot of resources out there. One of them is InterNACHI's member marketing team. The member marketing team is um, seven highly creative, professional graphic designers and illustrators and consultants. You call up the member marketing team. The marketing team does not work for InterNACHI in marketing. InterNACHI is doing well. They don't do marketing for InterNACHI. They work for you. Imagine hiring the cost of hiring seven people just to work on your marketing in your business. It'd be outrageous. You wouldn't be able to do it. But because you're a member of InterNACHI, it becomes a free service with your membership fee. They're there for you. Just like everybody on staff, we're all on the contact page and we work for you. So you have to take initiative. You have to contact the member marketing team and ask them this question. What can you do for my business? It's a great question. It's a great question. What can you do for my business? Call up anybody on the contact page. Education team, marketing team. What can you do for my business? Right? We have a lot of resources. I um, hope that helps. Because there isn't just one thing. Right? So, and I don't know your specifics. Right? Have you calculated a profitable fee? Have you... Um, have you put a call me now button on your website? Do you even have a, a professionally designed logo that you can put on your professionally designed business card? Because you need a professionally designed business card, marketing, package, flyers, brochures, rack cards, all professionally designed. Because if you're going to market to real estate agents, there's ways to do that too. A real estate agent can see from 10 feet away if you have a crappy business card. That's, that's their business. They're into that, right? So you don't ask your cousin to design anything related to your marketing of your business. Don't download, pull anything off the internet that someone else owns. Right? You have to, you have to do it yourself. And internet actually has a ton of resources. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, you know what? There's a lot, a lot of questions. How about um, I answer a few and then. We talk a little bit about the inspection, then I answer a few, and we talk about the inspection. So I want to talk about code. So when I was performing an inspection on this house, I really don't care what code says. I'm not a code inspector. I know what code says. It's part of my foundation of being a great home inspector. But as a home inspector, I have the opportunity and the freedom to say and do whatever I think according to the standards of practice. And I think there's a missing handrail here and a missing guardrail. Code says uh, any stairway with four or more risers has to have a handrail. Well, wait a minute, what if I have trouble walking and I have to go up into my house and I'm older or I have a bad knee and the brick surface is a little wet and I slip on step number two, riser number two. A code inspector will say, don't do it, do it, do it. not required. A real estate agent even might say, code inspector says it's not required. 
home inspector, we side on the client's side, our client side. We prefer to help them, right? So I'm going to recommend a handrail. I recommend a handrail on almost one step, right? It all depends. If there's two or more risers, I'm recommending a handrail. This one has three, four if you include the step into the entry, and there's a missing guardrail. Imagine someone falling. So a riser, let's say it's seven inches, three of them, say, you know, 20, almost two feet. That's a, that's a serious drop, less than two feet drop. Nope. I'm going to recommend a handrail here. Oh, so in the 2018 IRC, International Residential Code, section R311.7.8 handrails, it says handrails are required for stairways with four or more risers. And there's a link to codes online. It's a really long URL. Um, I'm going to take a screenshot of this right now and save it and type it in. Um, but not for a home inspector. We're not code inspectors. We don't even say code. So what I do is say to be safe, there should be a handrail on these stairs with three risers and a landing to the front door, a guardrail. There really should be on one side, both sides. Right? There really should be some something to hold on to if you're going to slip. And if someone says, well, code says, for I don't care what the code says. Well, this house was built back then to code, and it didn't have that requirement. Yeah, exactly. That's why I don't care, really, when these stairs or this house was built. Because according to modern building standards, you should have safety devices. Like at this house, when it was built, didn't have GFCIs. They didn't even exist. But nowadays... There should be GFCIs in the kitchen and the bathroom and the exteriors and all this stuff. There should be a handrail when your home inspector thinks you need one, right? It's not a requirement. It's really just a piece of a negotiating tool. Your home inspection report, the seller doesn't need to fix anything. But your home inspector should be there to help your client. Um, the home inspector is there to help understand what's going on. This is a safety issue. And you're not a code inspector. Whew. Not a code inspector, thank goodness. Downspout, dumping water right next to the foundation, that's no good. Um, oil fill and vent pipe, we'll get to that in a little bit. Now I'm going to where the juicy stuff is, HVAC, hot water source, water supply, drain, waste, vent, plumbing, HVAC. Thermostat, sorry, bad shot, flashes on. This is an old thermostat. Thermost old thermostats should be replaced with programmable ones, a couple hundred bucks, and you save energy. What if, it has nothing to do with HVAC, but what if you damage something during an inspection? Well, we wrote an article about that. What happens if you do damage during an inspection? Well, it's actually your job. It's part of your job. Don't ever feel terrible about damaging something during an inspection. Now, if you... If you knock over a vase with your elbow, right? But if it's a system or component within the standards of practice, let's say it's a, it's a, um, um, a, oh, <coughs> a sink trap, one of those uh, soft brass chrome plated sink traps, and you grab the sink trap and it crushes in your hand. What do you do? What I did, I did it all the time. I grab my hand, I take a picture of it. And then I tag that sink. Don't use it. I'll put a piece of tape over it. And uh, warning tape. Put a piece of warning tape over it. So people know, don't use that sink. There's uh, a broken sink trap. How did it break? Well, I was inspecting it, and it just fell into my hand. It just crushed right into my hand. It was, it was about as strong as an egg shell. Just So it's a good thing I'm here. I'm a home inspector. I'm supposed to find these things if I can, if I observe it, or... Put it, uh, if I observe it or find it or, uh, or you know, come across evidence of a prior patch or something like that, I'll put it in the report and we, we can negotiate over it. Okay, these be fixed, don't, don't use the sink. Done. If there's, you turn on an old dishwasher and it leaks on the floor, I'm not buying a dishwasher. It's a, it's a dishwasher, it leaked on the floor, it's not my fault. Yeah, I, I turned it on and it leaked on the floor, but I'm supposed to do that. That's my job, I'm doing an inspection. 
It's supposed to find problems. Right? Are you required to find all the problems in the house? Are you responsible for all the problems in the house if you do a home inspection? No. Only the ones that you both observe and deem to be major, material. That's it. So if there's a defect behind this wall, I'm not responsible for it. But if I find it and I deem it to be significant, major, material, I should put it in the report. If I do both, I see a hole in the roof and I think, man, that is a major problem and I don't tell my client, that's negligence, right? But if I can't see your problem, oh, you know, there could be water somewhere, there could be mold somewhere, I don't know. I'm not responsible for it. I'll take a look around. If I see it and I think it's really bad, I'll put it in the report because that's the standard to which I perform an inspection. But if I don't see it, it could be right there. It could be right there. If I don't see it, it's not within my scope. I can't report upon it. I'm not responsible for it. Back to doing damage. If there's, if I push the garage door opener, I use normal operating controls. I I turn on the heating system with the thermostat and it explodes, right? I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm not going to hide anything. First thing I do is take a picture of it. This is, whoa, I'm putting that in the report. I both observe that as a problem and I'm putting that problem in my report. I once pushed the garage door opener and the darn thing just fell in pieces. <laughs> right. um, no one told me that the garage door rails are loose and they had problems in the past. I'm doing an inspection, no one told me. So I, I hit the button, what a mess, yeah. What, what do you think I did? Took a picture of it, put it in the report. So I was like, whoa, I'm not buying anything new. This is my job, to find problems, right? So you have to think like that. And when you think like that, it kind of relieves you, you're not a code inspector, you don't have to comment on code. You're not, uh, you can't see through walls. You can't, you're not responsible for all the problems. Now it becomes actually fun. That's the whole point of all of this, actually. I wanted to get across to you that this is one of the funnest jobs in the world. And you get paid to do this. A lot of money if you set up your business right, right? And your marketing is right. So it's so much fun being a home inspector. I highly encourage you to do it and tell everybody that you're the greatest home inspector in the world. Right? Get a lot of experience, build yourself up, start marketing, and have a lot of fun, making a lot of money, doing one of the funnest things around. And don't worry about damaging something. And don't worry about not finding all the defects because you're not responsible to. And don't worry about code or the age of the house. There's a lot of things you don't have to worry about that you might be assuming, oh, I gotta worry about these, no. So much fun, so much fun. Um, here's a heating system. If you're unfamiliar with this, if you're in Florida, you have no idea what crazy stuff we do in cold climates. This is Northeast, and what we do is we suck this black stuff called oil out of the ground and we burn it so that we can heat our home, right? Crazy, so this is a boiler, it's filled with water, there's a burner that's sucking oil, turning it into a mist and igniting it. Flames shoot into a chamber, heats up the water in the boiler, and then we turn on a pump and circulate that hot water throughout the house. Crazy. That's why it looks like a mess. So much fun to, to uh, inspect. So in the front, there's this little thing you can pull off. You kind of can see that chamber of water. And I did that, and it is filled with soot. Like, what is this? Why is there so much soot on the out? I have no idea. Am I supposed to? Am I supposed to know what is going on here? Why is there soot all over this thing? Oh my gosh. No, I'm a home inspector. This is like walking along a path, right? And tripping over a stone, right? <laughs> a, a trip hazard. This is unusual because I've taken all the courses that I need to be knowledgeable about how to perform a home inspection. And when I come across something like this, sweat, it's like literally, it's almost like tripping over 
So it's so obvious and conspicuous. And I just put in a report as is a major problem. We need somebody in here to look at that further, right? And to fix it if it's necessary to fix it. That's it, I'm done. Click. This whole inspection of the boiler system takes maybe five minutes, tops. Click, I'm done. Whoa, there's a chamber, there's a burner. Half of the job of a home inspector is just identifying the components of a system. Um, circulating pump, emergency shut off switch, drain for the um, boiler system, rust on the jacket, discharge for the TPR, temperature pressure relief valve, when you heat up water, it needs to expand. There's a lot of pressure and temperature things going on. If there's a problem and exceeds certain kind of limit, we have to release it, relief it, release all that pressure and temperature and discharge that hot water, which could be scalding. There's 14 things that code, code says about how to uh, properly install or what a properly installed TPR valve discharge pipe should look like. And this is violating several, right? And that code in the 2018 International Plumbing Code, section 504.6, requirements for discharging piping. That information is actually in an international course about relief valves. And you can take a look. There's a few things that every home inspector should know. One is the TPR valve should discharge with a pipe, an approved material pipe, to the floor so that no one gets scalded with hot water if there's a temperature pressure relief discharge. Um, the flames inside the chamber have exhaust gases that are hot and they need to enter a chimney stack and take that upstairs, uh, out uh, into the atmosphere um, through a chimney. Remember, the chimney is unlined. Uh, damper control. Oil line, other components. Actually, the hot water comes from the boiler itself. Cold water comes in to a coil into the submerged um, um, container of hot water, boiling hot water. So it coils in, and as it co coils out, it's hot, scalding hot. So it has to be a temperature control valve on it because the hot water to all the fixtures is going to be 180 degrees, 200 degrees, right? And that's burning. It can burn a little kid. It can burn anybody within a couple seconds. So we need to control and temper that hot water coming from the boiler. It's missing on this old boiler. Oil storage tank. They store oil in tanks inside basements in cold climates. Crazy. There's oil fill pipe, oil vent pipe. There's the gauge. Oil filter. This pipe goes to the boiler, um, to the burner of the boiler. Um, the underside belly of the tank, I take a look at in the legs to make sure that there isn't any major rust. I get my screwdriver, or you can grab a, a hammer. I bring a hammer. I don't actually show it because nobody wants a home inspector swinging their hammer. Um, and I try to tap things. Um, but you can also tap and probe. Sometimes, sometimes you know, when you're probing a load-bearing wood component, wooden component that's load-bearing, um, and your screwdriver goes through it, right? That's wood rot. I leave my screwdriver in, and I take a picture. Remember, <laughs> if, you're, if you do damage, and you're within the scope of home inspection, right? You, there shouldn't be any damage that you find. So you should have nice pick tests. They're called pick tests, sound tests. We do. But if it goes through, I kind of crank it open, and I take a picture of the wood rot, and I put it back. So if my screwdriver goes through this pipe here, um, I'm taking a picture of it. It shouldn't. It shouldn't go through. It's a steel pipe. And if it does go through, that's um, 750, uh, 500 gallons, 750 gallons, um, that could dump in someone's basement. And we don't want that. Uh, uh, expansion tank. Hot water source comes from the boiler. And there's the, um, let's see if I can grab it. Can I grab that? Yeah. So there's the control valve for the hot uh, water. And um, that round circular thing is the domestic coil. Water supply. Water comes in from the street. There's a main shutoff valve, ball valve. And there's a ball valve there, water meter there, jumper cable, another ball valve, turn off, check valve, done. 
drain waste vent plumbing, some PVC, ABS, don't like the combination very much. Um, and then there's a sewer pipe here, cast iron sewer pipe, and it has a hole on top of it, and it's sewer, sewer pipe. And there's that, I lift my camera up and I take a shot and I take a picture. There's a hole in the sewer pipe. That's a major problem. It's in the report. Um, some other fittings here and there and some clean outs. I'm just looking for a nice slope on the drain pipes. Any active plumbing leaks that I can see proper support of the pipes. It's very difficult. These are crawl space. We've got asbestos material. Um, I will comment on um, any indications of apparent asbestos material for my clients. I'm not, um, I'm an EPA certified lead hazard risk assessor. I didn't do the asbestos. I don't need to. Um, so, uh, but that is asbestos and so is that. I want my clients to know that. Um, asbestos wrapped around the heating pipe there, going through the crawl space, I can't access it. Laundry, down in the basement there was a laundry tub, they removed it, but the fixture is still there, all right? Electrical, only takes, um, you know, um, 15, 20 minutes, electrical panel. The structure takes a little bit longer, because you're looking for me, structural problems, and water. Water brings life, but it, man, it can destroy a home. Um, so the electrical panel, Take a picture of the outside. All the breakers should be specifically labeled. There should be plenty of room. There should be a main disconnect somewhere. Um, there shouldn't be any openings where I can stick my finger and get fatally shocked. 100 amps, one finger is 100, two is two, uh, 200 amps. You do not have to remove the dead front cover. I do in order to provide value. We talked about that before in this class. Um, and then there's the old wiring and new wiring and I'm looking for essentially a big fat breaker on a thin gauge wire that's all overfusing. Um, so the wiring is okay. Um, I found electrical defects later on, so we'll have an electrician come anyways. Structure is very difficult. Can't get everywhere, but where I can get, um, it's old, original masonry stone, beautiful. The stone structure looks great, but when you have stones like this, um, you have Water. Stones are like sponges. They absorb water um, through wicking and absorption. And the dirt on the crawl space floor isn't a very good idea either. It's allowing moisture to come into the basement in the crawl space. There's a lot of um, structural things like extra support. Those two by fours were kind of nailed up into the floor to support the floor um, in certain areas. This was in the back room area. Maybe that enclosed porch area that was a porch and now it's being used as a finished room uh, it's a bit of a concern i don't really like the way this was installed um, it could be installed better um, and so if you know how um, in a pre-drywall inspection you get to see the studs you know that the top plates and the studs and the bottom plate kind of look different than what this looks like um, load bearing components are installed uh, a little bit better I mean, there's not even anything plumbed or fastened properly. Um, so taking a look at stuff. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of pieces and a lot of nails, and it's not looking all that great. Um, drain pipes, different materials. Um, the basement is difficult to see everything. Can't really look around. There's moisture on the floor. There's moisture on the floor. But, you know, I want to make sure that the, if I'm ever sued in small claims, have been a few times, no big deal. There's pictures that you take just to show that there are inspection restrictions during the during your time there. It was limited and restricted. There's dirt and, and moisture and corners and it's okay. I mean, now if my client wants me to do a, a lead test, I can do that. Um, lead, certified lead hazard risk assessor. It's a great service. Five, six hundred dollars per service. Basically, I go around and I do baby wipes on services, floors, and things like that, steps, landings, window sills, stuff like that. And uh, because we don't want small children to walk around, crawl around, and get lead paint content dust in their mouths, um, it kind of stays in a child that I, that's young. Um, adults, we kind of excrete it out. But um, the point is that no matter what home I'm in, 
I'm ready to offer the right service at the right time. So if I'm down in the basement, I'm down in the basement. Oh, by the way, this is that's what I used to do. This is a, a binder. I put my inspection report. If I print it out, I print it out on three um, hold punched uh, paper, and I print it out. I at least print out the summary, and I'll print out a, a, a sheet for the seller, and I'll leave that behind. But in the pocket area are some rack cards, marketing pieces for ancillary services. And if I don't know how to sell my service, right? If I'm not confident yet in speaking about things that I do to my clients, um, I could use something to help me. So I could say things like, while I'm here, you may want me to um, inspect for mold. So why? Because I can read it if I wanted to, right? So the member marketing team does this. Mold damages what it grows on, and the longer it grows, the more damage it can cause. So while I'm here, let me inspect your home for mold. Because I see indications of possible mold, but you never know until you test. You can have a laboratory. EPA says if you can see mold, it's probably mold you don't even need to test. But it's really up to you. If you need a report that says mold, then I can do that for you while I'm here. Now, I'm thinking about that fraction. Remember, we talked about the making money as a numerator divided by your time. If it's not going to add a lot of time to make a lot more money, ancillary services is where the profit is. So I'm going to offer ancillary services, offer the right. There's a story about, uh, my brother teaches it, um, tells it in his book about how to increase gross revenue. It's about um, being in a park and watching people go by on a sunny day. And there's two companies. One is an umbrella company, and the other one is um, an ice cream company. And the weather changes. It goes from sunny to rainy. And when it's sunny, everyone's getting ice cream. And when the weather changes, everyone's grabbing an umbrella. Right? There's a line for the ice cream at a certain time, and there's a line for the umbrella at another time. Same day, same experience, same people. You would never go to a park on a sunny day and think, I need an umbrella. Right? So what you want to do, is the moral to the story, is be ready to offer the right service at the right time. And if you can't, if you're not, um, don't know how to sell your services, I think it's just a matter of, you know, practicing experience and confidence. Um, there are certain things you can use to help you. So you could say, you know, you can't see, smell, or taste radon. Whoops, can you see that? Yeah, smell, taste radon. But it may be a problem in your home. And testing is the only way to find out what your home's radon level is. Let me test your home for radon. So while I'm here, Mr. Bob, here, read this. And while I'm inspecting the structure, the rest of the structure here, um, you can hire me to do your radon test if you want to. Um, yada, 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 150 bucks, blah, 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 right? So uh, there's a little business tip there. Let's finish with the basement, and then I'll take a look at questions. That's basement, structure. Oh, measuring tape is one of those tools that you asked about. So I, I take a measuring tape and I measure sometimes the, the depth or height of the floor joist, sometimes the length. If I'm doing like a new home and I'm with the building supervisor, I'm going to inspect the length of the dryer exhaust. I always get them on that. It's way too long, too many bends. Right? So I'm measuring um, a few other things you can measure, like access to the unfinished parts of the attic space or something like that. So sometimes you need a measuring tape. There's, uh, there's the floor, and it's the landing at the top of the step. So that's what um, is in um, a compromised kind of structural situation. We need somebody to come in here and fix that. I'm going to inspect the attic now. And there's the unfinished attic. But wait, let's see what kind of questions we have. Um, let's see. Did you inspect the roofs in bad weather? Remember that? Okay. What, most important tools. Advice on advertising. I'm not getting any calls. We answered that. What are your thoughts on drones for roof inspections? Good. We talked about that. Drones provides value. 
Um, how can I assure potential clients and real estate agents that I'm worth the inspection fee? And is there a form, form or, or hotline I can contact if I run into something on my first few inspections that I don't understand how to inspect? Uh, yes and yes. So um, about an inspection fee, you have to be able to calculate a profitable inspection fee, and that's chapter 11, I believe, in the home inspection business course. You know, I showed you previously how to get to the home inspection business course. Just go to our education page, type in business in the search field. Um, and then um, there's other things that you can do. There are tips on how to market to real estate agents because you mentioned that and uh, what potential clients and real estate agents that I'm worth the inspection fee, right? So there's a general rule of thumb, overwhelm with value, 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 right? My value is um, my brand. Like we're, we're actually talking about my brand, your brand. Your brand is what distinguishes you from all the rest. Your brand answers the question, why should I hire you instead of the other inspectors? Because if all of you, all of your ins inspectors are saying the same thing, you're essentially doing the same thing too. We'll talk about that. If you're all saying the same thing, then the only difference between you and other inspectors is price. And that's no good for anybody because consumers tend to um, shop for price. So you don't want that. And lowest price wins. That's really bad. So the idea is, what is the question? How I short potential clients and real estate agents that I'm worth the inspection fee is to overwhelm them with value. It has to be obvious. Just blow them away. How do I do that? Well, it's a mental exercise. Line yourself up with your competitors, right? You go to an Internet G chapter meeting and you know, think of all your competitors, your friendly competitors. You have to figure out what they're doing in comparison to what you're offering. What are the benefits that you offer potential clients? Why should I hire you? What problems do you solve? So, if you line them all up and you ask all of us home inspectors, um, those of you who have a license, please take a step forward. Well, let's say I'm in a license day. I take, we all take a step forward. So there's really no distinguishing characteristic in that one. How many offer the Internet Chief Buy Back Your Home Guarantee, where we buy back the home if, you're, if your home inspector misses anything? Oh, half fuss. That's awesome. How many um, immediately make the home inspection report and summary with all the pictures and videos immediately available after the inspection by downloading it from the cloud? Oh, that's software, high-tech software. How many, um, now there's only like four of us, how many um, include a free infrared scan with every inspection? Um, now we're down to three, right? Three. And when I said free infrared scan, I actually meant free infrared scan. I don't. I didn't charge for using my infrared camera. It helped me do a better job. All I did was, because I was adding value, I increased my inspection fee in order to pay for the infrared camera at first, and then it's extra money profit, right? Um, how many um, walk on the roof? Uh, is that an unfair question? Uh, too bad. How many walk on the roof? Because that's my brand. Because the question could be, how many use a drone? No, oh, I wouldn't walk forwards. Darn it, all the drone people went up in front of me. Now I'm behind. How many people offer a newsletter, the InterNACHI free newsletter to keep in contact with your past clients? Oh, I forgot about that. I didn't do that. I was watching TV. Oh, yeah. Um, how many offer a home maintenance book bound in a beautiful three-ring binder for every one of your home inspection clients. Oh, I was playing video games, I was fantasy football. So now I'm way behind, and my competition now is way in front of me. If they keep going with all these value questions, they distinguish themselves from all of the rest, us losers back here, and they're way out in the field all alone. And it's very easy to find them. And we're back here at the chapter meeting complaining that our phone ain't ringing, right? How many have online scheduling through their website? Oh, 
oh yeah, I was, I was thinking about doing that. You know, and now that, oh, Sally's way up there. Sally, the inspector, certified inspector Sally is way up there. She's way up there. Oh. How many have um, text chatting feature on their website so that when a website visitor jumps on your website and is scrolling around for a couple of seconds, the website actually tells you you have a potential client on your website. Would you like to call them? And you push a button, their phone rings. It's, it's like that. It's kind of like that. Oh, Sally's way over. Oh, she's far in advance. Maybe I'll think about doing something else. Right? So you have to think about how you distinguish yourself from all the rest. Right? And you can use the search engine that InterNACHI has to look by zip code at all of your friendly competitors, spy on them, figure out what they offer, what problems are they solving, what benefits are they providing, to your clients, right, that you're trying to get. You're trying to get the same clients, right? So that's that's the fun part of business. And I don't even know what, what, uh, well, what's the question? Oh, so how do you ensure? If if you provide value, incredible value, that's all it is. So there's no secrets in this, right? So how do you get from here so where Sally is, way out in the field all alone, way ahead, charging $500 in this question, making a lot of money, going on vacation, right? you need mentoring or coaching or help from other inspectors. So we have an online form, natcha.org slash form. You can go on the online and ask questions. We have a mentoring program, natcha.org slash mentoring. Um, I like inspectorcoach.com, inspectorcoach.com. Um, on the online form, there's an emergency button, a big fat red button. You click it, and you can get to speak to other inspectors while you're inspecting. So if you find something that you don't know, what, what is this? You can go online, excuse yourself somehow, go online, hit the red button, and talk to other inspectors about what is this, and you post it, right? Or Facebook is a good one, too. I didn't have that kind of time. What I did was, I simply said, I'm inspecting this, I don't, I don't know what this is, but I guarantee you, I promise you, that um, by tonight or tomorrow morning, I'll know what this is, I'll look it up, and I'll tell you what this is. And if we need to change the report, I will. I'll just add an addendum or something like that. It's a material defect. But I don't think it is. It looks like some kind of doorbell thing. Right? That's what I did. I never said, oh, I know what this is. This is a discronificator. Yeah, it's okay. It turns on every once in a while. No, I just said, God, I don't know what this is. Jeez. I don't know, but you know, I'll figure it out for you. I don't think it's major, but you know, I'll put in a report if it is one. And that's that satisfied my clients. Don't worry about not knowing. Just say I don't. I don't know, but I'll find out for you. Yep. Okay. That's good service. Um. How do I price a multi-unit 12 lodgings? Well, that's way beyond the standard of home inspection. Home inspection is four units or less in, in the same building. So you're into commercial now. And the internet, she has a commercial saying it's a practice. Then uh, if you want to do a commercial inspection, you can get trained and certified as a commercial property inspector through internet. She. There's also another organization called CCPIA.org. CCPIA.org. Join that organization. Uh, there's a commercial standards of practice too. So follow the standards of practice. I was a home inspector. I did um, mom and pop pizza shops and dentist offices and things like that. No big deal. But the big buildings, yeah, you need some additional help. You need help. You need to be more of a manager of experts. You bring an electrician, you bring your HVAC guy. It's going to take multiple days, you know. So, um, Let's see. What do I? What do you use for serial model number breakdown? These are good questions. Okay. So there's this company called Building. I don't know who it is. I think it's just a. Um, I think it's a home inspector. Building-center.org. Building. There it is. Building-center.org. I don't know anything about it, right? I really don't. 
but it tells you these ages, HVAC age, water heater age, and recalls. And it's a free service. You take a picture of the manufacturing label, later on you can go HVAC, look up the model number, and it tells you the serial number and when it was made. Boom. You look up recalls too. Like it's it's an amazing buildingcenter.org. I don't know who this is. Um, I've never reached out to them. Um, so yeah, but I would use it. it seems like a cool service and looks pretty accurate to me. So that's one of the things that I would do with serial numbers. Um, as a home inspector, you're not required to, and uh, you know I, I wouldn't do it in my inspection report because you're not required. Although, I, as practice, I take pictures of all the manufacturing labels just in case I need to in the, um, in the event something else comes up, a question comes up. I'm in the attic space and there's no insulation at all. I can see the wood lath and plaster. So we're in an old home. It's great. I see the new sheathing, right? It must have been slate um, or wood shingles. Um, so there's new sheathing for the roof. Structure looks great. I see knob and tube wiring. Knob and tube wiring is really old antiquated wiring. And I am flag knob and tube wiring as a material defect. And then I need an electrician to come in and take a look at this and let them say hazardous or not hazardous or potential or whatever. For me, this is a hazardous wiring method. It's an ungrounded, antiquated method of wiring that has inherent flaws in it and hazardous conditions. So if you insulate around knob and tube wiring, guess what happens? It heats up and catches on fire, right? So, um, so structure looks okay. Missing insulation. There's no insulation in the walls or ceiling of this, of this house. That is a lot of energy being lost. I'm glad I can tell my client what's going on. Come out of the attic. Now I'm doing the interior. Interior is maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, tops. There's the interior there, a lot of inspection restrictions, plaster, a lot of water damage, cracking, plaster, um, uh, peeling paint, peeling wallpaper, likely lead, all that is in my report. Even if I'm not lead certified, you know the older homes that are painted with flaking paint, you ought to say something. Missing insulation, that's the chimney, right? Yeah, that's the chimney with bird um, droppings. Interesting. Um, knob and tube wiring, wood lath. Ooh, someone was chewing on this. this is, um, um, old NMB cloth sheath, um, but uh, it's been chewed up, so that's an electrical hazard. Someone needs to get into that. Knob, tube, wiring, no insulation, crack, water uh, stains around the... Whenever I see a water stain, um, you can get your water meter out, but let's say you don't have a water meter. No big deal. Indications of prior roof leaks. Have your client ask the seller to explain about roof leaks. It, if it's not wet, if it is wet, it doesn't matter. You've identified it and you flagged it as need further evaluation. Okay? Any kind of watermarks could be an indication of something active or something in the past. If it's in the past, great. Let the seller explain that. If it's active, it doesn't have to be wet for it to be active. It, it could be a dry day, right? But you see water marks and indications of something wrong. Okay, a lot of watermarks, a lot of watermarks. Interior, the interior, take pictures of every room, ceiling, floors, um, ungrounded receptacles, deteriorated paint, lead content, um, cracks, cracks in the plaster, watermarks, um, toilet, flush the toilet, try to move it with the side of your leg to see if it um, wobbles and a bad wax seal. Uh, if it leaks on the floor, that's not your problem. You're, it's okay to... Uh, do that within the scope of your inspection. Um, the sink should not be detached from the wall. Hot and cold water, plumbing, trap is okay, GFCI receptacles. Tub, run water, hot and cold water. I actually like to push on the tiles of the tub. If they're soft and my hand goes through, which it has in the past, um, it's not my fault. I'm not causing the damage. I'm just observing it. Um, there's a window inside the shower. Uh, the window ledge uh, with loose tile, that's a problem. And um, the glazing 
um, is an issue for me. I'm not uh, an expert on identifying window and glass block. I don't care. I'm not a code inspector, but I know for sure that you can't have a window in a shower. If it's up high, you can, but code standard construction methods say from the floor surface to a certain height, um, you shouldn't have any window unless it's like a safety area because this is a hazardous location, right? So you have to have safety glass or glass block. So whenever I see a window that's low, close to the shower floor, I get a little nervous, right? And safety glass should be identified with a label that's etched in. And this one isn't. Uh, there it is, 2018 IRC, section 2406.1. Safety glazing should be installed in showers where the bottom of the glazing is less than 16 inches from the shower standing surface. This is a hazardous location. There are several hazardous locations identified in code. And as a home inspector, you don't have to know all this. If you're using mobile software, just put it in your notes, in your software, so that while you're inspecting, you can refer to something. You don't have to push the red button on InterNACHI's forum and talk to inspectors live. You can like have information, resources to help you. That's why, that's another benefit to using mobile software. Crack glass, vent, windows, smoke detectors, any smoke detector that's uh, um, yellow <laughs> in color should be replaced. And here's a GFCI tester. Oh, I don't have that one either. So I'm missing my 61 screwdriver and the GFCI tester. You need a GFCI tester. Someone asked about tools, essential tools. You need a GFCI tester. So you stick it in a wall outlet and confirm that the three-prong receptacle is actually missing a ground. There's the handrail, guardrail, interior, two-prong receptacles, interior, interior, back door, receptacles, some of them are dead, radiators, there's a bulge in the wall, not sure why. Looking around, more smoke detectors. Laundry, the laundry, remember there was a sink they, they brought up in the basement, they brought it up. Laundry is next to the kitchen. Remember that, it was down in the basement. Well, here it is here. Run hot and cold water at the sink. There's a um, clothes washer hookup, hot and cold water, drain pipe. It's um, against code, standard um, building practices. The standpipe is whacked. Uh, there's a certain standard by which you have a standpipe. Um, dryer vent should be exhausting outside. This one isn't, um, and it's not even there. Electric baseboard, just that provides some additional heat. The original heating system didn't get to this room. There are rooms without heat source, like the third floor. But I turned it on, turned on. It smelled really bad because it was burning dust on the, on the fins. The interior ceiling of this back porch turned into a laundry room area is okay. Inspect the kitchen. Kitchen, old kitchen, run hot and cold water. That's a mess. Those are weak pipes. I didn't crush them. I took a picture of them. They need to be replaced. Missing ground fault receptacles. Even though there are GFCIs there, they're not functioning. Old range, old oven, electric oven. Top oven didn't turn on because it's filled. So I don't turn anything on like this. If you do, make sure you hold on to the handle and turn it off. Don't leave that oven, don't leave that range on. And so that was one of our rules for inspectors. If you're gonna test the oven, you have to hold the, onto the handle and don't let go. Um, you don't want to turn on the oven and leave for the rest of the day and then someone comes home in the evening and there's, there's problems. Um, so it's an older home. My client knows what they're getting. Bit of a fixer upper. I do the report summary um, at the last 15 minutes. Um, and at 11 o'clock, I'm basically done. I'm ready to go. Report summary with the client and get paid. The entire report can be available right now as a link to the cloud. And here's a report. Here's a report summary. Um, unlined chimney. Um, Handrail, missing handrail, exterior water faucets. No, there are no water faucets on the house. Uh, missing GFCIs. Um, there's a hole, large hole in the cast iron drain pipe. Remember that? Um, no hot water was being produced by the domestic coil, by the way. Um, I think 
the remember the all the soot in front of the boiler that was a problem um, the relief valve on the heating system uh, isn't discharging very well not every room has a heat source um, there's a repair needed at the landing at the top of the stairs exposed exposed dirt on the floor of the crawl space remember that the dryer vent needs to go outside missing GFCI receptacles in the in the laundry um, in the attic, there's knob and tube wiring, and there's some damaged wire, frayed sheathing, something that's been chewing on it. And there's no insulation at all, in the, no visible insulation anywhere in the whole house. Oh, and um, there's a, a hazardous window area in the bathroom, and receptacles are non-functional in the kitchen, and smoke detectors need to be replaced. That's the summary. I print that out because they want something. My real estate agents, I ask them. What do you value in a home? Especially, said, "Well, if you can give me the summary, print it out, two copies, that'd be great. One I'm going to work on, the other copy I'm going to give my client. We're going to go back and forth. The one I work on, the circle, I'm going to hand it over to the listing agent, and they're going to we're going to negotiate on it. We're going to fix it before we move in, or we're going to get some money, or we're going to negotiate on that. So I can do that. I brought a little printer in, sewed a little handle to it, boom, plugged it in, getting ready, my laptop, boom." I can print out, boom, from my laptop. Because my mobile device, I'm inspecting, and it's actually syncing. On my computer, I log in to my software website portal, and I can print anything I want, and edit anything I want, boom, and sync it. And I can print out the entire report, I can print out the summary, I don't have to do anything. It's all available online through a link, because I capture my client's email and my client's agent's email. Now, when I'm at this point, Doing all this fancy stuff with my software and reporting and binder, and I put the summary in here and all. Hopefully, a lot of agents are there. The listing agent is there, and being impressed by the incredible value that I provide to my clients, and I call them clients. They're not my customers. I have a client base. If any one of my clients call me, even if it's during an inspection, especially if it's during an inspection. I answer the phone. I excuse myself from my current client and say, this is one of my past clients. If you give me just a second, I'd like to see if I can help this person. My past clients. And that current client is like, ooh, like the inspector I hired has a client database. Like we're all part of this network where I'm the inspector and I have clients. And I take care of my clients. That's the way to handle. Um, where's I going with that? Oh, so I'm doing all this fancy stuff, handing out the home maintenance book, buyback program, other reports, ancillary server, cloud, links, all this stuff I'm putting out, and I, I basically sell the other agents in the room. They all know that their home inspector isn't the best, say it lightly, that they just found the best inspector for them. If they like, if they agents like it, and then they start to talk. Now I have a network of ambassadors out there, of real estate agents who are talking well of me, and I don't pay them. I just make sure that I take care of their clients. Yeah. So that was the summary report. Here's the entire report. Uh, before I get to that, though, let's see. Are there questions? There are. Um, I don't know. Two hundred questions. <laughs> Can I talk about water quality? What do you do? Um, you go to your local lab, usually there's some kind of relationship in, between the township and the water lab, and um, they have kits. And so we get all these bottles and boxes, you know, and we make little kits for the home inspectors and little packages and coolers in case you're going to need to cool, like a coliform sample, you need to cool it, keep it cool. So you have uh, like lunch boxes, potentially, uh, you know, hopefully you know that you're going out to do a a water quality test so you can prepare this package for your home inspector. And the home inspector goes to the office and says, I gotta do water quality. They open the refrigerator, grab the ice pack, the package, and then the water bottles, and they go, right? And then they do the water sample, and they bring it back. And ideally, they don't bring it back to the office, they drop it off at the lab, because the lab needs it real quick. The lab analyzes it, and it's usually 24 hours to 48 hours. And that is a really good relationship. Water quality is difficult because you have to take the samples in bottles. It's a lot of physical, manual stuff. You take it to a laboratory. You have to drive there and then drive to the next job or whatever, right? So uh, 
that's difficult. Radon is difficult too. If you're doing it all on your own, if you have help, that's really great. They can pre-place the radon tests, and when you go to the home inspection, you simply pick them up, right? Um, or data dump it. So, um, yeah, um, that's water quality is uh, difficult, but it could be really profitable. I mean, we made a lot of money on doing water quality because um, the quality of water is what it used to be. Even if it's public water, we know that, right? There could be lead in the pipes now. There could be some kind of weird chemical helping us stay healthy. Um, and if it's a well, private well, for sure you should test that. So, yep, and we have an interior water quality uh, well training and certification course. It's online and free to members. How much are the certifications? The certifications are online and free to InterNACHI members. There are, are no exam fees, there are no tran um, transcripts fees, there's no uh, fees for the exams or the training or the courses, they're all online. That's why step one and 15 steps to be a successful home inspector is to join InterNACHI, because a whole world of opportunity opens up as you're a member of InterNACHI. You have access to all this stuff and it's online and there's no additional fees. All the certifications, all the logo downloads, all the illustrations, all the gallery stuff, it's just all free. To internet G members. Yep. I would definitely be an internet G member. I'm not even a home inspector. Mole inspection, hazards to inspector? Nah. Um, you know, face mask. Right? High, high quality. I don't like the full face because it gets all messed up. But I like this one. Um, and then I also have a Tyvek or a canvas suit for crawl spaces, gloves, hat, helmet. All depends on what you're into. You need safety protection, personal protection equipment. How much should I charge for a partial inspection, like a deck or roof inspection? Oh, that's that's part of the math, right? You can you can charge per hour. You can figure out how long it takes to do a, you know, a roof inspection. Less than an hour, even including the report, because you inspect and re write your report as you inspect. So what do you want to make an hour? You go the other way. You can reverse design. I want to make $100 an hour. Well, you got to charge at least 100 bucks for that hour. How long does it get you there? How long does it take you to get there and back? Uh, an hour total driving, an hour and a half total I don't know, on average. So you want to make $150 to $200 to do a roof inspection. Right? That's going to take you one hour. What else is involved? Well, you need a ladder. You already got one? Yeah, okay, so you don't need to invest that. You already invested that. Overhead tools, the mm, certifications. Well, you need an internet membership, right? Stretch that out. You know, you have to think what what factors are involved for you to make hundred dollars an hour, and what's your profit on it? For hundred dollars an hour, doing a roof inspection only, a partial inspection. There's probably a lot of profit. If I can do it in less than an hour, that's really good. It's difficult, difficult to calculate profitable profitable inspection fees without using math. If you're just looking around at what your competitors are doing, you're probably gonna underprice yourself because a lot of inspectors don't know what they're doing and so they're, they're just they're driving the price down. And to stop that, two things. You wanna communicate that we all gotta be going up, right? Not driving down. That's no good for anybody. And, um, Learn how to provide incredible value and relationship with your client base and real estate professionals. And join other networks, other professional networks. Um, I know of a home inspector who visited us here at NHA headquarters. Green, totally green, five months ago. Now they are networked with so many other professional organizations that they're doing like specialized kind of inspections. A little bit of commercial, a little bit of roof, a little bit of advising, a little bit of consultation, a little bit of oversight and jobs, you know, when a bank needs to know if there is a, a phase completed, they can do that. Right? And if it's all calculated with math, if you know how much you need to charge per hour or per job or partial inspection, um, then it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can do home inspections, 
ancillary inspections, partial inspections, it's all profitable because you've done the math, you've done the hard work. And that's chapter 11 in the home inspection business course. What type of shoes am I using? Oh, for walking on the roof, uh, sneakers. Something soft sold, like soft sold, the, but the bottom is soft. And no aggressive tread, but nothing completely flat either. That's too slippery. And um, so that's the roof and that's the exterior. Shoes are the same thing. Unless it's um, boot weather. So I have boots untied, I pull them up and I do my boot uh, exterior like um, brand new home that doesn't have any grass or snow all around. So I'm in my boots and then if I need to go on a ladder or something or into the house, different shoe. So I have a ladder shoe, right? Sneakers, no aggressive tread to get up there or interior shoes only. And all of this is, I, I would have interior shoes only and I carry them in my tool bag. This is a fantastic tool bag. They still make this. I, this is exactly my tool bag that I've used all my life as a home inspector. They still make it. Large mouth, open tool bag with lots of pockets for all my extra tools and plenty of room for I can attach it like that, right? I can put my, even a drill to get into um, attic spaces if I need to, you know, take off a, a drywall screw. I can put stuff in there, right? And my shoes go in there as well. And I just shoulder strap it and I bring it, that's the first thing I do, I bring everything to the front door. I get out of my truck, I'm early, remember? And, and earlier in the class I talked about arriving early. Put all my tools next to the front door, I step ladder to the attic, all my gear is there, tools, and then I go grab my ladder off of the ladder rack on my van and I do the roof inspection. And when, I, when you do a roof inspection, you can put this on the ladder rack when you're done, right? And if you're going into a crawl space, put this next to the crawl space opening, especially if the crawl space access is in the floor. You don't want someone looking up and falling through the floor. I don't know how I got on that subject. <laughs> um, should we, should we against SOP having walking on roof? Hmm. I'm not sure what you're asking. Should we against? Should you go against the standards of practice by walking on the roof? You are. If you walk against, if you uh, it's called exceeding the standards of practice, not going against it. It's called exceeding the standards of practice. Standards of practice is the absolute minimum that's required to perform whatever you're doing. So the home inspection standards of practice is the absolute minimum things you're required to do to perform a home inspection. Absolute minimum. You're looking down like this. Absolute minimum. I tend to exceed the standards of practice in a consistent manner for all my clients. I use tools, not required to use specialized tools. I walk upon the roof, you're not required to walk upon the roof. I open things, I move insulation, you're not required to, and I exceed the standards of practice in a uniform, consistent manner for all my clients. So all my clients can expect me to try to get up on the roof. All my clients can expect me to use a flashlight and an infrared camera and a moisture meter. All my clients can expect me to try to use a tool I can go up in the attic or open spaces and kind of measure the insulation, move it around and stuff. Right? So I exceed the standards of practice. Not required to. If you want to play it safe, absolutely abide by the standards of practice. Not just substantially, but totally if you wanted to. Um, and we have an article um, written by our legal department about exceeding the standards of practice and that it's okay if you do so. You need to just do it consistently for all of your clients. Um, what's the best reporting program for a quick turnaround? Anything that has a mobile feature, so mobile software. That's what I recommend. Um, let's see. I often get the comment from real estate agents that I point out too many items that they say are not important enough to be pointed out. Where do you draw the line for providing good inspection and not overdoing it? using the definitions of what a defect is. So not everything is a defect, right? And not all defects are the same. 
So there's cosmetic defect, which means agent, you don't even have to think about this. This is just a stain on the carpet. But my client probably wants to get in a report. We all know cosmetic defects are blemishes, flaws, really irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the real estate transaction at all. This is a beautiful dream home. It's going to close, but I'm going to put this blemish in the report, just so it's in the report. It's not part of the negotiating. It won't be in the summary. It's not going to be highlighted. Minor defects. These are things that should be fixed, but the homeowner can do it. Your client can do it. After they move into their dream home, they can do it. Change the thermostat to programmable. Change the air filter. Okay. Uh, replace the clothes washer hose. Right. Clean the gutters. Major defect. You may want to negotiate over this. Okay. So, agent, I'm going to highlight major defects in my report, and they're going to be um, headlined with a header. Major defect. I define what a major defect is. That means it's a problem that I observe. I deem it to be a major defect, and we need a contractor in here, right? We can talk about that in the summary. It'll be in the summary. It's one of those things we negotiate over. There's another defect where this is going to hurt someone. It's called a material defect. It's so important. It's, de it's defined in the standards of practice. It's something that poses an unreasonable risk to someone's health, someone's life, or has an adverse impact on the value of the home. So a material defect, as an example, would be A, um, a deck that um, isn't secured, isn't self-standing, and it isn't securely attached to the house structure, and there's missing flashing, and there's evidence of wood rot behind the ledger board, so now the fasteners are actually not attached to the house at all, and the deck, the deck collapse is imminent. That's a material defect. This poses an unreasonable risk. I know this because I've deemed many decks as a material defect because of those situations. Several, right? And we have to tell the seller and the occupant, I don't want anybody on this deck. That's really bad. That is a material defect. So major defects, material defects. That's what we allow me then just to inspect the heck out of this thing and make a, a 50, 60, 70 page home inspection report. The summary will only be one or two pages and it will only highlight the real serious stuff that you need to fix or negotiate over. Okay, Okay. now I have the freedom to do whatever I want. Oh look, there's, <laughs> there's a stain on the carpet. Click in the report, page 10. Oh look, there's a minor, there's an air filter, boop, click. You know, now you can inspect the whole house. There's always a um, there's always a way through the issue that you have, and you can just talk to your mentor or fellow inspector or your inspector coach or someone online on Facebook or on the Internet you forum. You know, there's always an answer. There are no secrets to running a successful business in which you just happen to perform inspections. There's a chimney flu. That's in the report. Love my inspection reports. My inspection reports, everybody loved them. I think it's because of the pictures. Lots of pictures. There's so, so many pictures that I could possibly put in the report. I took maybe three or 400 pictures altogether, but um, well, let's see. We know how many pictures. What slide is this? Darn it. I don't have a number. Well, let's, let's say it's 300 pictures. Maybe 40 are in the report itself. Um, and the other ones are archived and available. There's a picture of me walking on the roof and touching the shingles. There's a gutter. There's a downspout problem. There's a siding coming in close contact with the ground. That's no good. All of these are monitoring is recommended. Some cracks, some hairline cracks, some stress cracks or hairline cracks or shingles cracks or something in there. Just monitoring is recommended. And some cracks in the sidewalk improvement can be done. But the missing handrail, that's a correction. That's a major problem. Uh, there's no air conditioning, by the way. Um, there's the heating pipe. Uh, oh, no, sorry, this is the plumbing. Cast iron has a hole in it. There's a water shutoff valve. There's the boiler. There's no hot water. There's electrical. There's electrical panel. The wiring seems okay, except for the knob and tube wiring in the attic. There's the boiler. We have a problem with the boiler, but the components there are listed. It's kind of neat where I just list the components, right? So 
in the report, this is how I wrote the report. You don't have to, because I'm just trying to share what I did. So I think of it as a system, right? From far away, I take a picture of the system, and then I move closer, and I about halfway, and I take another picture, right? Looking for maybe irregularities, anomalies, defects, and then I get up close and I touch every component. And I take a picture of it. And I talk about it with my client who's behind me, right? This is, this is the flashlight, this is the, and this is the thing, that's the, that's the air filter, and I didn't put it over here. This is the, it's where hot water comes in, but there's no hot water, there's no, you know, you know, click, 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 writing the report. And I may need, after I do the inspection of the system, I may need to like step aside and go, uh, put details in my software, okay, done with that system, next, right? And it takes, you know, some time to do that. Take some time, uh, inspect your own home like 10 times. You'll see the difference between inspection one and inspection 10. Even on your own home, same home, you'll get better. So practice, 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 inspect, 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 and um, learn how to talk and write and inspect and all at the same time. And uh, it's, it's just a lot of fun. Anyways, system and then components. And then as I, I have my software, which is essentially my inspection process, laid out for me in a checklist form. And when I print it, it's like this. When I publish my report, it's system and components. So I have system, heating, description, and then it's a boiler, description of the type of heating system, and then thermostat, electric shutoff switch, the burner itself, next page, the circulating pump, the damper flue, the relief valve. This is how I inspected it, and this is how the report is too. I, I just don't miss anything. Expansion tank, service record, observation, inspection restrictions, estimated age. You don't have to do age. Oil storage tank. That's the system. Components. Or there's the oil filter. Next page. It just goes on like that. System, components. System, components. And you have half of your work as a home inspector is identifying components correctly. The other half is determining whether it should be in the report or not. Do you have evidence, have you, do you have the evidence of a defect that you observe during your inspection? If you do, and you deem it to be material, it should be in the report. Um, do you use a separate camera or your phone camera? I would use my phone camera. I do use my phone camera because it has camera and video, um, and you can do selfies. Um, and I used to do um, home inspections with uh, two pouches like this guy, um, where there was a camera in one pouch and a camera in the other pouch. One camera was pictures and one camera was video. And then you take out the chips and you stick them in the computer. What a mess that was. So this is the way to go. Mobile software. Um, how much do you charge for a radon test? I assume you pick up the canisters as well. Yep. So it's really up to you. I mean. How much do you charge? You actually, you know, with all due respect, shouldn't care what I charge. It has nothing to do with me. What if I charge well below? What if I'm starving, not making any money, and I charge a certain price? You don't know that I'm doing bad in business. And if you are going to price your fees against with my fees, well, we have different needs. I have different goals. I have a different desired annual salary. I have different overhead. I have a different profit margin. What you know? Who cares what I do? I charge 125 bucks. But maybe I, maybe that's no good for you. I don't know. So you have to do the math yourself. How do you do all of this? How do you do all this work? Figuring out all this stuff in order to run a successful business. Well. I'm gonna tell you. There's a couple couple things to do. One of them is what my brother recommends. My brother Nick Amico, founder of Intervention. He says, go to one of your hardware stores and buy one of these. This is how you run a successful home inspection business in the beginning. You buy one of these, right? And then you walk up to your TV and you smash it. <laughs> you no longer have a favorite TV show. You do not play a video game. You do not do anything that's like fantasy football, right? This is the reality. You are in business. You're now going to do 30 to 60 minutes 
every night working on your business. You, you are not a couch potato. This is exciting. This is fun. If you don't have a home inspection to do, you are working on your business and marketing. You're calling up your inspector coach, inspectorcoach.com. You're calling her up and you're working one-on-one -on, -one on your next thing, on your next task that you need to do. Remember the soundboard? You're pushing up a lever here or there. Just a little bit of work every day. If you calculate it out, if you do 60 minutes a night, five nights a week, that's, um, that's five hours, right, a week. 52 hours, that's 240, is that right? Uh, 20, let's, let's go 20 hours a month times 12 months. That's easier for me. That's 240 hours of work that you invested at the end of the year if you did 60 minutes, one hour a night for five nights in the week, right? Five nights, five, five 20, 10, 20, yep times 12, 240. 240 hours at the end of the year is what in weeks? 40 hour weeks, that's six. Six 40 hour weeks that you worked on your business and your competitors didn't. You are six weeks ahead of everybody else and you didn't even hire anybody. You just put in the effort, put in the work, right? And that's smart, that's smart work. Right? Okay. So, yeah, well, that's one of the ways you're successful. So, there's no binge <laughs> uh, watching. I don't even know what that is. Binge watching TV shows or something? Yep. So, uh, back to my report. Pictures, um, the components are identified in blue because it's like neutral, but if they were black, it's hard to see. So, uh, I liked blue, black text and red for things that need someone's attention. I didn't try to um, pull any punches. Red means bad. So I have correction and further evaluation recommended. Bold, red, all caps, italicized. And then the paragraph below. Repair is needed at the floor landing at the basement stairs or some inadequate support boards installed here that do not appear safe, right? So we need somebody to go in there and that will pop into my summary. There's a crawl space, there's a dryer, laundry room, there's the attic, no insulation at all. House has had roof leaks in the past indicated by the watermarks or stains on the roof decking and components here and there visible from the attic space. This is commonly found in older homes, no major structural damage, but ask the seller about prior roof leaks. Monitoring is recommended. Uh, I like that. That's called a narrative. That's what you click, right? in your software. You don't actually write all that, right? I got fat fingers, I can't do that. So what you do is on your computer that's synced up to your mobile device is you type in your narratives. What do you wanna say, if I, you have to imagine, if I see watermarks in the ceiling, what am I gonna say? Well, here's something you can say. You can actually use these, you can copy paste this, I don't care. Copy paste my narratives. My sample reports are available online if you wanna download some sample reports, take them, copy, paste them, uh, use them, right, to your advantage. Um, take advantage, that's kind of like what Internet does. We provide a lot of resources, you gotta take advantage of them. Um, and that's what I would click. I would click that paragraph. I want that paragraph in the report right after that picture. Click. Software is fantastic. Um, there's pictures of the knob and tube wiring. There's more pictures there. There's the bathroom, GSVI. Uh, there's a window. Um, there's the kitchen, not much in there. Smoke detector. Uh, receptacles. There's the handrail and uh, a little thing about my clients, how I described that we prefer to have our clients with us um, for a few reasons. We can answer all of your questions and address your concerns as they come up. Number two, we can both see the condition of the property at the time of the inspection, because conditions change. Immediately after I leave, the condition of the home can change um, dramatically. Number three, I can elaborate on what may be complicated or technical. So. My client wasn't with me, I stuck that in the paragraph, and that helped me later on to describe to the judge that my client decided not to be with me and that I prefer them to be with me for several reasons. And one of them would have been very helpful um, in this situation that we're in right now. And you know, small claims, if you have all of your legal documents um, 
set up um, online agreement system through Internachi. It's free. All your documentation, you have standards of practice, you refer to your standards of practice within the inspection report. You provide additional information um, to your client, just overwhelm them with information that um, explains certain things that they are required to do. It's titled now that you've had a home inspection for a reason, because the the home is now in your client's hands. <laughs> it's no longer your responsibility. Now that you've had a home inspection, who's responsible? You are. And here's some information. Good luck. Home ownership is wonderful, but it's a responsibility that I'm not going to take as a home inspector. If the roof leaks tomorrow, um, it has nothing to do with me. Um, and these graphics or illustrations can be downloaded from InterNACHI's inspection gallery for free to members. You can you know, spice up your inspection reports with these. That's really cool. I just threw these in there, um, but that's kind of neat to describe maybe complicated issues. And there's a conclusion and a walkthrough and a, a little letter for the seller who I intend to win. So I have my client with me, right? My client's agent is with me. They both like me. I win. I earn their, the listing agent. The listing agent is there, right? I earn that. Uh, I work really hard to get that new agent. If the seller isn't there, they usually aren't. I'm going to leave a little gift for them because I'm going to get them too, right? I'm a, there's only the pie is only so big in my township. I'm I'm going to make sure that my clients are my clients. I'm going to keep them too. Uh, here's a marketing piece, marketing uh, idea that um, Internet Cheese member marketing team has created. Um, you can buy these in bulk and leave them for your seller. It's kind of funny, but it's one of those little touches that doesn't take any time, but it really has a big impact. So thank you. It says, it's a lunchbox, right? It says, thank you for allowing us to inspect your home. Look inside. We really appreciate you. There's my business card. So you look inside. It's cute. You can put it on the kitchen counter or something. And the seller opens it up. Jeez. What? There's what? And it's up to you. I don't know. So we put peach candy in here. Peach flavored candy. Peach Inspections was our company name. Um, Dan Keo still runs it, um, an Inachi member, um, and uh, it's Peach Inspections. Peach Inspections is a, you know, a great name. Um, we named the name Peach Inspections for a reason, because um, we wanted it to be memorable. Um, we had a big peach on the side of the van. We gave peach candy. We delivered peaches to offices, fresh peaches from the farm. We um, had fresh baked warm peach pastries uh, to sponsor the weekly meetings at real estate offices. Um, uh, we didn't wear peach shirts, but um, we dealt with um, real estate agents who were mostly female. So the peach is kind of um, soft, effeminate, and I wanted it to be, instead of masculine, I wanted it to be somewhat, I wanted to connect. Right? Um, so that's one of the reasons why we, so you have to think about your inspection company name. It's important. It's going to be with you for a long time. Um, and inside, um, here it says the same thing. Thank you for allowing us to inspect your home. I realize that I'm a guest in your home and I conduct myself with the utmost respect for your property. Although I had to open and close windows and doors and test systems and appliances, I made every attempt to leave the property in the same condition that I found it. However, please take a moment to check the following to make sure that I have reset them for you properly. It says door locks, GFCIs, lights, co alarm codes, faucets, additional comments. Once again, thank you so much. If you ever need an inspector, don't hesitate to contact me. That's really nice. Someone's going to open this for sure. No one's going to throw this away. You're gonna, definitely going to open it. And you're definitely going to be impressed because it's unique. It's a unique value proposition. So in marketing, we call these things unique value propositions, unique selling propositions, unique selling points. So this is a UVP, a unique value proposition. So this is something special that you um, leave behind because every seller could be a potential buyer, a client of yours. So, and this is unique, right? And it helps sell your services. And that's... You know, it also explains that you wore indoor shoes only. 
I actually take pictures of my feet when I go in to show that I'm in my, not slippers, they're shoes, but they're absolutely clean. So you have to have fun in business and marketing strategies. And um, you're not alone. Uh, Internet has a ton of resources, even credit card swiping resources. So if you need a merchant account, if you want to take credit cards, um, you can do Square. It's really easy. Um, Internet has um, something at this URL, natchi.org slash merchant to look at to help with credit cards, accepting credit cards. Everyone uses credit cards. And here's your homework. Um, natchi.org slash everything. That's where we find the 15 steps, sequential steps for successful home inspectors. Natchi.org slash mentoring. That's where you find experienced inspectors willing to volunteer their time to help others. And I really like inspectorcoach.com. Go to that site and download the free checklist from inspectorcoach.com. All right, my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from Internet. You've been watching Natchi TV. <laughs> That's the only TV you should be watching. Thank you so much. Um, I'm on the contact page if you need me. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I have a lot of questions to answer. Um, I'm going to answer them all. If I don't get to you, feel free to just reach out to me. Um, I'm on the contact page. Email is best. Um, don't call. I can't answer the phone all day long. But email, I can do that very quickly. And the answers that I give are usually online. The resource that you're looking for is online, so I'm going to send you a, an email with a link. So that's why I like email. Um, we have another class coming up. Please uh, subscribe to the Internet G newsletter when you receive it. It has all that information in it. Go through it. It's a long, robust, content-rich newsletter that we send out every month. Open it up. There's some good, juicy stuff in there. We don't repeat anything in there. Um, and there's some advertisers in there, too. You may need their services. And I think that's about it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. It was an awesome class. Thank you for showing up and participating. I'll see you in the next class. Bye, everybody.